feel like I have kind of like my own entrance song when that happens, like I, like the Bulls players or something. Probably not the same, not the same. I don't, I don't know if you caught this this week um, or if you are sort of a, a, a um, cultural, if, if you pay attention to this kind of stuff. I had never heard of this person before this week, but, but she made news by being a social media celebrity who decided to completely get off social media. Her name is Asina O'Neill. She's a teenager who lives in Australia. She's um, apparently a model, and she decided this week that she was going to completely delete her Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook uh, pages from the internet. Um, she made statements like, this is not a real life, and that she was a lost and lonely teenager. Before Asina O'Neill um, deleted all of her pages, she changed some of the captions. I brought an example on some of her photos in order. I don't know if you can read that or not, but essentially what she was doing uh, is she was changing the captions on her photos in order to expose kind of this manufactured life that they were meant to portray. She was basically saying like, look, it took me like 50 times taking this picture. This wasn't just some spontaneous moment that I captured where everything happened to look perfect. Um, her encouragement to her followers, to those that follow her on Instagram and Facebook and, and all these other social media outlets is to get off of social media and what she says, quote, do something real and have a real conversation with the people that are there with you. It's been interesting. It's actually been interesting watching the response to her decision. Um, people sort of like reaching out almost in defense of Instagram and Facebook as if they needed uh, a defense, almost, almost kind of attacking her decision in some ways. And the reality is, and, and I think we're probably all aware of this at various levels, is that we live in, in what we're calling, I'm calling a selfie culture, where our perception of reality, or at least what reality is for other people, is defined by these snapshots um, that come across our phones and our tablets and our computers and, and all these different outlets through social media. Just to kind of put some context to this, you may already be aware of this, but each year the Oxford English Dictionary, which is widely regarded as kind of the premier authority in the English language, will, they will choose um, a, in their research department a word of the year that represents an important cultural development. The word of the year in 2013 was selfie. Selfie is the word that the Oxford English Dictionary chose as a representation of an important cultural development. And whether or not we like it or not, they're right. They're right. It's true. I just did a quick search on Instagram under the word selfie and found 221,155,346 posts. And those are just the selfies that are labeled selfie. There's literally hundreds of millions of more on Instagram without that label. And what is the objective of, of all of this, of these candid, spontaneous, self-taken pictures on, on social media? I mean, is it, is it the goal to gather more likes? Is it the goal to increase those people who are our followers, which is an interesting term given what we're going to be talking about tonight. Our goal is to, to increase those who follow us on, on social media. And my, my objective here as we're getting into all of this is not really to rail against social media. I'm, I'm on social media. Others are on social media. I'm, I'm not, that's not the point. And it would appear that it is, it's, it's here to stay. We can say that for certain. And of course, um, this is not something new. I mean, people have been taking and sharing pictures. In ancient times, people were painting self-portraits. That, that's not really the point. And we've been capturing memories and, and sharing those with our friends and families. But there is, I think at least from my perspective, some cause for concern about the implications of living in a selfie culture. 
that is just bent on increasing our followers and gathering more likes. For instance, one, one thing to, to be aware of is that one study found that on average, a young woman between the ages of 15 and 25 spends one hour per day taking, editing, and posting selfies. And all of this is illustrated by this, this conclusion that this Asina O'Neill comes to, that, that the image that she was projecting, the life that she was living, was ultimately a false reality. These carefully posed and selected moments, oftentimes staged in order to convey a particular image. And that image just happens to be false. That was her whole point. It wasn't real. The life that she was living wasn't real. I mean, we rarely, after all, post the pictures online where we look really bad, right? Not many of us race to make sure those are on Instagram or Facebook or any place else. And all of this to say that as our culture seems to be increasingly fascinated with ourselves and we have this increasingly fascination with others who are equally obsessed with themselves, it leads us now to this text that we're going to be looking at in John chapter 3 where I think we discover something of an important corrective with regards to what it means to follow Jesus in the midst of a selfie culture. Let's turn there now. John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 22 and read through verse 30. Would you read along with me? It says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing them. John also was baptizing at Aon near Selene because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase but I must decrease. I, I love this. I love this story here. And, and despite the obvious vast cultural and social differences between when this was written and when this took place to where we're at now, I believe that it remains extremely relevant in, in our faith journey. As we work our way through the story, this is just kind of a, a bit of a side note here. As we work our way through the story of Jesus, this is the only story in our entire series where Jesus does not speak, nor is he present with the ones who are speaking. And yet he remains, obviously, the central character of this story. I want to take a moment here before we sort of get into to John's response to to look at the context that this is unfolding in, to unpack this a little bit. And we're, in fact, actually going backwards a little bit in this story as, as we read this. Because uh, what's taking place in this text, as you saw noted there, is this is happening before the arrest of, of John the Baptist. John is, is, is pointing that out. In Mark's gospel, if you've read that, um, it, it appears that, that, that Jesus' public ministry all sort of took, took place uh, following the arrest of John the Baptist. But John wants us to know here, and he's specific to point it out, this took place before John the Baptist was arrested. Interestingly enough, he clarifies in chapter 4, verse 2, that, that it was only the disciples of Jesus who were doing the baptizing, not, not Jesus himself. And this baptism that he's referring to, this isn't, this isn't exactly what you and I think of as, as Christian baptism. Much like we saw in our Acts series last year when, when the disciples would take the gospel into various regions and people would respond and they would baptize them. This, however, was more of a, a public confession of sin. 
followed by full immersion to symbolize repentance and, and cleansing. So what's happening here is we've got John the Baptist and, and his disciples who have been preaching and calling people, the people of Israel, to repent in, in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And the people are responding. They're being baptized. They're hearing the message and, and they're confessing their sin and they're identifying in that through baptism. And now we have Jesus and his disciples who are just, who are just a bit further down the river who are doing the very same thing. Two men with followers and a following who are operating their ministries in close proximity to each other. You get the picture. Now, I have grown up in the church my entire life, and I have been in ministry my entire adult life. And I know that we're all supposed to be on the same team and that we're all moving in the same direction. But I can tell you from experience, it doesn't always work out that way. Primarily because the church is built with human beings and full of them. And so sometimes there's competition and, and jealousy and, and even rivalry. I can give you an example. When I was a youth pastor in in Wheaton, I'd been there for several years at, at this point in time, um, just kind of in a neighboring community, a new youth pastor sort of came to one of the local church and, and he was like the thing at the time. Like he was young and he had like tattoos and piercings and like, you know, everybody loved him. You know, everybody's like checking out his ministry and I, I'll, in complete transparency, like I struggled with and everybody was always talking about he's always at the basketball games and he's always at this event I'm like yeah, he doesn't have a wife and kids like he doesn't even know what it's like yet like give him like a little while you know like and and I was there in that moment where I'm you know like I should have been celebrating like ah, yeah the gospel's going forward but but times I was looking at him I was like this guy's never gonna last you know like this whole tattoo thing's gonna wear out or whatever and I totally remember thinking those thoughts. And I think this is just a microcosm of what John the Baptist's disciples are feeling in this moment. What they're experiencing there. And so they're, according to the text now, the disciples, there's something of like a dispute that arises between some of John's disciples and what, what's just an unnamed Jew in the text who we know nothing about over the topic of purification. Essentially, there was a debate about the meaning and the significance of, of John's baptism and the one that Jesus' disciples were performing. And we aren't provided all of the details here. I, I, I researched this, and there's various theories about this. But it seems as though this is something of a technical debate over Jewish purification rites and the role of John's baptism in that. But whatever, whatever the discussion was about, it has stirred something in John's disciples. It leads them to come to John the Baptist with a question, and, and essentially they're asking him why Jesus is letting his disciples baptize as well. Basically, they're saying, John, this, this Jesus, who just for, again, context, you baptized him, now he has followers, who are baptizing people. Why? Why is this okay? Why is everyone now following them? And they're understandably concerned. Like, I get it. They perceive that their ministry is becoming less significant as people go to the new guy. And what is that going to mean for them? And this is the context then that John responds into. And I believe that his response to their question is both powerful and profound. And it remains incredibly relevant and necessary for us today. I'm going to go back now to John 3. Let's look at this one more time. We're going to start in verse 27 as John responds to the concern of his disciples. John answers and said, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. 
The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, my joy, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. I want to point out a couple things about about John's response here. And, and first and foremost, what stands out to me is that John's response to his disciples begins by establishing a proper view of God. It begins by establishing a proper view of God. And I've said this before in, in previous sermons, and I think it bears, is, it's worth repeating that how we understand or how we think about God is the most important thing about us. It is at the core of our theology, no matter how defined or undefined that theology is. And it's at the core of our practice, our actions, how we live out our faith. Everything about how we live our lives, whether whether we're conscious of it or not, is rooted in our understanding of God. I would agree that this is absolutely universally true for all mankind in, in every culture or in every time in every place tozer um is a pastor is famous for uh, um his line one of these lines that that we quote all the time and i've i've quoted it before but again i think it speaks perfectly to this it says what comes into our minds when we think about god is the most important thing about us i remember kind of put a different way if you've ever seen the movie rudy the Notre Dame football player who's dedicated his life to making the team and, and, but is undersized and underqualified. And he's having this conversation with, with an old priest and the priest responds to him. He says, son, in over 30 years of religious study, I've come up with two uh, undeniable truths. There is a God and I'm not him. I think that's a pretty appropriate response. John now responds to his disciples because it's abundantly clear that he has a very different perspective on what's happening here. His disciples see what is happening, the momentum that seems to be surrounding Jesus, the growing increasingly movement that people are going to him and the reduction, their concern of their own significance. And John responds to his disciples And he says, this isn't something that you and I should be worried about. This isn't something, this isn't cause for concern. This is cause for celebration. If people are going to Jesus, if they're responding to his message, then he's saying that that is from God. Look at verse 28. He says, "Uh, don't you remember what I told you? I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John is essentially saying, look, this is not about me. And I've been telling you this all along. John gives this illustration in the text here. He talks about the bride and the bridegroom in verse 29, essentially saying that the focus of of a wedding party isn't on the best man, but rather it's about the bride and and the bridegroom. He's doing something important here. In in the imagery of the Old Testament, the The bride and the bridegroom was used throughout that time to illustrate the relationship between God, between Yahweh and his people of Israel, where God is described as the husband or the bridegroom. In in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, it says, your husband is your maker. In Isaiah chapter 62, verse 5, he talks about, as the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. Look at what John the Baptist is doing here. With this description to his disciples, if Yahweh is Israel's bridegroom in the Old Testament, and if John the Baptist is proclaiming Jesus as Israel's bridegroom here, then John the Baptist is essentially saying that Jesus is Yahweh. He's making the clear statement to his disciples, Jesus is God. Jesus himself would later use this same analogy with John's disciples later as he explains to them why his disciples aren't fasting. And he says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Here's the point. 
A proper view of God means understanding him as he is revealed to us in scripture and as he is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants his disciples to understand. We need to see God as he is and who he is. John's response begins by establishing a proper view of God, but then he continues to help them understand what is taking place by helping them build a proper view of self. A proper view of self. And I'm not going to say a lot about this this evening. Um, There's a lot more that we certainly could say. But I want us to establish that John's sense, his his understanding of himself is rooted and found and, and, uh, uh, and established in his understanding of who God is. This, these are intrinsically linked. John Calvin, the, the uh, 16th century reformer, as he wrote his Institutes of Christian Religion, he begins them by saying, nearly all the wisdom that we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of these two parts. The knowledge of God and of ourselves. I think we can say that we cannot truly begin to understand ourselves until we first know God. Until we begin to understand him and who he is and what he's done. And, and for me as a youth pastor, um, and, and I, I would say this is just as vital for us as adults, but that's the role that I live in. This is, this is one of the fundamental truths that we seek to teach our students. That we come back to time and time again because we have discovered that if we can root their sense of identity in Christ, if their understanding of who they are is, if it's found and established in him, it will affect nearly every other aspect of, of their life. It will affect their behavior. It will affect their priorities, their values, their relationships, everything. If we can root their identity in Christ, if it's true that they can see that they are sons and daughters of the almighty creator king, it changes everything about them. And it's true for you and me as well. And furthermore, if we look at areas where we struggle with sin, and we, we trace those back to their root cause. I would argue that oftentimes, if not every time, I believe that you will find that we are operating, that the root cause of sin, the struggle in our life, is that we are operating out of false or a, dist, uh, a distorted sense of image. We either believe something incorrectly about who we are or we believe something incorrectly about who he is. So I think the question that we have to wrestle with here this evening is what what identity are you operating out of? And this isn't about self-esteem. This is about finding our identity in Christ. Our selfie culture that we live in in this day and age has started us looking inward. That's the central message for our own sort of, we are the central character of our story. But the Bible is, it is emphatic on this point. If you want to know who you are, we begin by looking upward to God, where he is the central character of our story. In this exchange with his disciples, John here is very clear. He knows who Jesus is. And in light of that, he understands who he is. He knows his identity and he establishes it by an understanding of who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, we see that people were coming to John and they were wondering if he is the Messiah, the Christ. John emphatically, unequivocally denies it. He knows who he is. He knows what he has come there to do. And for that reason, when people choose to follow Jesus, John does not get competitive or or get defensive. He celebrates because this was the point all along. For John, the point, the, the whole reason for his ministry has been to prepare Israel for the arrival of the Messiah, for Jesus. 
And now that is taking place. That's unfolding in front of him. This is why John says to his disciples, you've heard me say this before, don't you remember? I am not the one. I am not the Christ. I've been sent before him to prepare him. His sense, his understanding of who he was and what he had come to do was rooted in who Jesus is and what he was there to do. A few years ago, Pastor Jeff wrote a 10 minutes with God that was out of this text. In that he said, this is such an important lesson to keep in mind that all times, all of my gifts, abilities, opportunities come from God by grace alone. Everything. Do I have a sound mind that came from God who wants me to use it for his purpose and glory? Do I have money that came from God who wants me to use it for his purpose and glory? Do I have a ministry or a place to serve? That too came from God who wants me to use it for his purpose and glory. John knew that he was the forerunner of the Messiah and he sought to fulfill that ministry which God had given him to do. Essentially what John is saying to his disciples is, look, your life, what we're here for, what this is about, this only makes sense in light of the one who gave it to you. I think Jeff um, articulates that really well. Lastly, then, we see that John gives his disciples a proper view, a proper understanding of joy. I think that this is, this is kind of interesting here because if anybody, if anybody could have claimed some sort of selfish pride, if they, they could have fallen into that trap, It's understandable that it would have been John the Baptist. After all, who else can claim to to have been, besides Jesus, of course, to have been filled with the Holy Spirit from the time they were in the womb? That's a pretty impressive um, resume. He has a unique calling from God. He's he's been given, uh, nobody else could claim the sort of authority and, and role that he has. Even Jesus In the book of Matthew, refers to John the Baptist as the greatest among men. He he saw almost instant success as he began his ministry. Immediate impact. People were following his ministry, and it was growing rapidly. But in the midst of all of this, he understood what his life was really all about. Let's look one more time. At John chapter 3, this is verse 29 and 30. He says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears and rejoices at the bridegroom's voice. He says, Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Look what John says to his disciples. My joy is now complete. Why? Why is his joy complete? How is it complete? Because Jesus is here. For John the Baptist, what it meant to experience joy, the source of his joy is Jesus. It wasn't about how many people he had baptized or was currently baptizing. It wasn't about how much attention his preaching was generating or how many followers he attracted. It was about Jesus. His joy was found in Jesus. Just a moment ago, as we were talking about our our sense, our understanding of self, I asked you to consider where you get your identity from. We can now look at John's instructions here, and we ask ourselves this question, where does our joy come from? For you and I, what is the source of our joy? Because far too often, I think, we glean it from secondary things, like achievement or recognition or increased influence. But for John the Baptist, those those weren't his source of joy. Joy for John the Baptist came in the person of Jesus. John here is he's revealing to us something about the nature of joy, what it is, because happiness is circumstantial. It has to do with, with how we feel in a given moment. But joy is something greater. It's something bigger. Joy, true joy, transcends our circumstance because it has less to do with me 
and everything to do with him. Now it's in in light of this kind of joy that John's conclusion is so powerful and profound. So relevant to the Christian life 2,000 years later. Because his conclusion, his instruction to his disciples is this. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. This is the outworking, the conclusion of John's understanding of who God is, of who he is, and of what joy is. He must increase, but I must decrease. Two imperatives that are inseparably linked, that must go together in the life of the Christian and in the life of the church. This is the very definition of of biblical um, humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, like like low self-esteem. It is thinking about yourself less. And to think about God more, to rejoice over him. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, I do not imagine that if you were to meet a truly humble man, that he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. So for me, here's the question or the challenge that this text generates in my own life. Is what does it mean for for me to decrease and for Jesus to increase? What does that look like practically? What does that look like in the workplace? What does that look like in relationship with my friends? What does that look like in my marriage? What does it look like in my marriage for for Jesus to increase and me to decrease? What does that look like in how I use my time and my resources? What does that look like on social media? There's a challenge for you this week. How on social media can we increase the glory of God and decrease the story of ourselves? This is the challenge that I want to leave you with this morning, this evening. What does it look like? What does it look like to have less of me and more of him? Would you pray with me? Father, John's response to his disciples is clear, but it's not easy. But God, I want, I want less of me. And I want more of you. So Lord, show me what that looks like. Make it clear to me. And give me the courage and the strength to follow it through. Allow us to do that together in community as the church. And so in your name we pray, amen.